me tell you a little story about Tom, Dick, and Harry. Three guys, three friends, who hung out, researched, studied, and had big ideas about the world and about what they could accomplish in the world. This is their story. Hello. Welcome to For the Quantum Grammar Shoe Podcast, the only podcast of its kind on the interwebs. I'm your host, Colin Jason, I'm Matthew Colin Glass. Um, in this podcast, what I normally do is I'll pick a topic or a couple topics and look at it through the lens of correct sentence structure, communication, parsi, syntax, grammar, the wonderful grammar technology brought to the public by the late Colin David Ivan Wing Colin Miller. However, in this episode, it's story time. I'm going to tell you a story about Tom, Dick, and Harry. However, I'm not going to tell you whether or not they bear any relation to anyone who ever existed. They may have, they may not have. You can listen to the story, and you can take from it what you will. Sort of like, uh, you know, the way folks interpret the Bible, or the Quran, or the Talmud, or the Bhagavad Gita, whatever, how they interpret things however they want to, that's the same thing you can do with this story about Tom, Dick, and Harry. All right, so let's begin. So to begin with, in the, I guess, early 80s maybe, Tom went through a divorce and got his children taken away from him. And so this uh, scenario caused him a great amount of stress and discomfort, enough to where he wanted to do something about it because he felt that the United States legal system and the legal system in general was just crooked and unfair. So he studied and he argued with the judges, so on and so forth, and uh, had conversations with some of the judges who gave him little cryptic hints about how he could navigate himself through the system, the fiction system. So Tom did that. He took their advices to heart and allegedly he had many conversations with them. They came down off the bench, took off their little black dress and told him the quote unquote secrets of the legal system and he got his kids back long story short so going into the late 80s he met or came in contact with Harry who was about his same age maybe a little bit younger and they found that they had a common love of freedom, meaning they had a common love of being autonomous. They wanted to be able to live their lives outside of the legal system, outside of having any entanglements with the birth certificate system and all that stuff. Shortly after that, I think maybe early 90s, Dick came on board Tom and Harry met a young kid named Dick now this kid was really young if he wasn't a teenager he was in his early 20s and he sort of became Tom's apprentice so together they did a lot of studying a lot of researching a lot of experimenting and they developed a technology, a communicative technology. Matter of fact, it was mathematically based and it was a grammar technology. They developed this. It's a, a, a system. Each of them, well, okay, Tom came up with the bulk of it. Like, 
I would say he probably developed about 75 to 85% of it himself. Dick added an element to it uh, to sort of bring it up to date. Because they were looking at these legal contracts and insurances and mortgages and things like that, everything was always in past and future tense. But the dichotomy to that is everything is happening right now. There is, right now, there is no future or no past. It's just right now. So Dick said, well, let's word it in such a way that we're not talking about the past. We're not talking about the future. We're talking about right now, all the time. We'll quote unquote, take jurisdiction over the now space. Tom and Harry were like, wow, that's awesome. Let's do that. Now, Harry, the part that Harry brought to it was the etymology of it. He studied the roots of words and developed what we now call the system of particles of negation. Like, you look up a word, a vowel in front of a consonant, it means no. Prefixes, suffixes that negate the now space means no. So that was Harry's end of it where he, he was looking up the uh, nativity root meanings of the particles of words. So you got Tom, who was the leader, we could say. He was in charge. There's no doubt about it. Then you had the young kid, Dick, who brought the now space to the, to the concept. And then you got Harry, who brought the etymology to the whole thing. And so they developed, actually literally developed a system that they felt would help to extricate them from the fiction legal system and the whole birth certificate system in general. They developed what they called a live life claim. So if you think about, uh, the, the way I can convey it to you is that in the fiction legal system, you have what's called a birth certificate, which literally has nothing to do with you. Meaning, your connection with a birth certificate is assumptive and presumptive because you didn't have anything to do with that contract. Someone else made that contract and presumptuously tied you into it because you, I have to say, you know, you did not willingly autograph it. You didn't help to author it, authorize it. <clears throat> you didn't willingly put a thumbprint on it or anything like that. No, it was made really without your knowledge probably by your parents or guardians and the foundling hospital or wherever that, that you were birthed physically into this domain. So Tom, Dick, and Harry developed what they called the live life claim to claim jurisdiction over a punctuated name written in their mathematical interface on grammar, copyright copy claim, so that you or anyone else who had a live life claim would have total autonomy and take total responsibility, accountability over their construct using the live life claim, the grammar on the live life claim, uh, postal mechanics, flag mechanics, banking mechanics. Also, um, all right, I also have to share at this point in time in the story, which I just reminded myself of it by talking about the mechanics of this live life claim that they developed, that around this time, Tom and Harry and Dick, well, let's, oh, let's see. I'm trying to remember how the story goes. Tom, quote unquote, captured the one by 1.9 flag the stars and stripes of the past tense United States of America. Keep in mind, folks, this is a story. This, whether it's true or not, it's not for me to say. I'm just telling you a story. It's up to you whether you want to participate with it or not. All right? I'm just putting it out there, sharing the data with you. 
Tom, Dick, and Harry do not necessarily have anything to do with any people that have ever existed or currently exist or anything like that. Anyways, so Tom found out that the copyright to the 1x1.9 Title IV flag was running out. And so he and Dick jumped on it and created their own copyright for it. And did all the postal mechanics and things like that. And they quote unquote captured that flag and then decided, Tom, Dick, and Harry, to quote unquote register it with the UN as a grammar flag, a flag of correct grammar. Meaning, as Tom would say later, It's the flag of the land during the time of the contract. And supposedly they were successful with this. Now, this is when they began clashing with the governments. They would go travel to The Hague. They would travel to Bern, Switzerland, to the UPU, and um, the Vatican, and all kinds of stuff challenging folks telling folks about their grammar technology but all of this culminated in basically what would some folks could call a showdown at the Pentagon in Washington DC where Tom Dick and Harry confronted the governments of the world and said hey you are not correct You do not use correct grammar. We can, quote unquote, disqualify, nullify every single contract that you have because you do not use correct grammar. And according to the legend, the governments of the world agreed that yes, this is true. However, for whatever reason, they weren't going to let this get out. They didn't want this to... They, they didn't want to change their system. Let's put it that way. They didn't want to correct their system, update the system. They want things to go on as they are. For obvious, you know, you can guess as to why they would want to do that. Why would they want to wreck all that money they got coming in through taxes and whatnot and people working nine to five and the public slave school systems and the prisons and all kinds of military, industrial complex, the pharmaceutical industry, all that stuff would vanish in a wisp of smoke if things were suddenly fair and put on a geometric level playing field of contract communication. So the fiction system knew this. The governments of the world knew this. So they said, what do you want? What what do you want to do about this? Can we come to some sort of agreement? So Tom, Dick, and Harry, mostly Tom, of course, because he did most of the talking, Tom said, well, how about this? We'll have our system, our live life claim system, to the folks who want to learn it. They can learn it. They can get the live life claims. They can do their contracts using this correct grammar. And you leave them alone. In turn, we will not challenge you. Um, In the public, we will not you know, prosecute you, we will not persecute you, we will not mess up your system. It'll be a choice. If folks want to participate with the grammar, if they want to learn it and, you know, invest the blood, sweat, and tears in this stuff, then you leave them alone. And they can do what they want to do as long as they're not hurting anybody and be autonomous of the birth certificate system. On the other hand, they... And we will not come after you, the fiction system, and try and get you to change to correct grammar. In other words, live and let live. We'll leave each other alone. It's a choice as to people in the world if they want to, you know, do this or do that or do the third. Everybody was happy. Fiction system was happy because they knew that they weren't going to be put under the microscope and and, uh, forced to... (laughs) be fair and equitable in their decisions. They didn't have to do that. And Tom, Dick, and Harry were happy because 
they knew, well, at least I think Tom knew and Harry knew, the, probably not Dick, though, because he was a, a young fella. And young fellas, although they think they know everything, don't know anything, really. Um, but Tom and Harry knew that it's a choice. Contract is by consent. You can't force people to do things because then when you start forcing people, then you're no better than the oppressors that are oppressing you. So it's all got to be a choice. So they went home. They agreed. They shook on it. We will not mess with the fiction system. We will not challenge the Pentagon. We will not challenge the United States. We will not challenge Washington, D.C. We will not challenge London. We will not challenge the Vatican. We won't challenge anybody. Live and let live. Everybody was happy. I wish the story would end there. Because it's a pretty happy ending, isn't it? Well, guess what? The story didn't end there because Dick, (laughs) being the young, impetuous, passionate, reckless kid that he was, decided, F this. I'm going to challenge them. And he went back by himself without Tom or Harry and I don't know if it was unbeknownst to them or if they knew or whatever, but he told them what he was going to do. He said, I'm going to go and I'm going to do this. Are you with me? Because it's not right what they're doing. Um, It's not right at all. I'm going to call them to the carpet. I'm going to call them out. I'm going to challenge them. And Tom and Harry were like, hold on a minute here, dick. We agreed. We gave our word that we would not do that. We gave our word that we would not go there and challenge them. We wouldn't give them a hard time. We weren't going to make their lives a living hell because they agreed that they weren't going to come at us. They weren't going to come after us. They weren't going to give us a hard time or any of our people a hard time. It's a mutual agreement. You can't do this. Why are you doing that? And Dick was like, Without, you know, I guess he just felt really strongly about it. So Harry, Harry said, I'm out. I'm done. I am not going to have anything to do with this. I'm leaving. I'm never going to use this grammar again. I'm out of here. I'm going to go do my own thing. And he left. He didn't want anything to do with that. Tom stayed around. Because he was the master. He couldn't let go of the technology for whatever reason. But he didn't really, um, how can you say, he didn't, he wasn't, he didn't take the lead role in this particular scenario. Dick had the lead role. So Dick rolled up to the Pentagon, court-martialed, we, we can say court-martialed uh, certain folks, called them out, did exactly what he promised not to do, he did it anyways, went back on his word, and it threw everything into turmoil for everybody involved. And Tom was basically left in the wreckage of what Dick created, the shipwrecks that Dick created by breaking his word and going back on his word. So Tom, to protect himself and his family, had to make deals with certain unsavory individuals in order to try and salvage his and his family's lives, you know, going down to his siblings, his uh, children and grandchildren, and he was thinking ahead, you know, he was like, I got to do something to help protect this because Dick really screwed all this up. So, he and Dick continued to work together for a few more years. But for whatever reason, none, none of it ever, none of the work they did ever really affected anything in the fiction system. In other words, what Dick wanted to set out to accomplish never got accomplished, probably because... He broke the first contract. 
If he didn't agree with the first contract, then he probably shouldn't have went along with it. In any case, brings us to where we are today. In the storyline, I mean. Which may or may not be true. Harry is off doing his own thing. He actually promotes a lifestyle being quote-unquote free of the system, but it has nothing to do with uh, a mathematical interface on grammar. But he is out there still doing things. Tom passed away. And when Tom passed away, Dick immediately came forward and took everything that they were doing that was once free to the public and tried to stuff it away behind a paywall, tried to bottleneck it, tried to basically make it an exclusive pay-to-play technology. Unfortunately, though, the master did not teach the student everything. At least, that's what it appeared to be on the outside when looking at certain documents that Dick would publish in the public. It was quite obvious that his claim of having closure on grammar is not true. And that's easily provable to someone who does have closure on that grammar. But still, he persists, and he still claims the same things he's been claiming since he went back on his word and went to the steps of the Pentagon and challenged the fiction system and court-martialed everybody. He still makes those same claims to this very day. But nothing ever comes of it. Um, no perceivable changes or, or positive results ever happen in the fiction having to do with anything that he claims. But that's the story. And I wish I could have ended it when they agreed to live and let live back halfway through the story. But that's not the way it ended. Um, so that's the story of Tom, Dick, and Harry. And again, for the third time, I will mention... This story does not necessarily have to do with anybody that ever existed, exists now, or will exist in the future. Um, you can take from it what you want. The whole thing could be an allegory. It could be an analogy. It could be anything you want it to be. I'm just putting it out there in this form um, because I feel like folks ought to have an open mind about things and I think the folks who ha um, are open-minded will glean from this what my volition is for them to glean from this story. And they will understand current events better than they did before they listened to this podcast. Thanks, folks. This ends this story time edition of For the Quantum Greer Shoot. Good night and have a pleasant tomorrow.